I'll start with just the S class. It's like, for, from an American perspective, it's like your F-150, right? I mean, this is your bread and butter, your money maker. Um, what can we expect from this new, new version? The S class is the flagship of the Mercedes-Benz portfolio. It's uh, we put all our engineering prowess into this vehicle, and it's like it's it's the heart and soul of the brand. So when we do a new S class, it's got to be pushing the technological boundaries in literally every dimension, uh, and at the same time, time it has to represent. Uh, this timeless elegance and what modern luxury, what contemporary luxury should look like now and beyond. So a blend between innovation and uh, 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 great aesthetics. It's a car that you sell a lot in the Asian market, but of course Mercedes has always represented the pinnacle of luxury in the US as well. Um, are those markets equally important to you when you design a car like this? Absolutely, the S-Class is, is really a world car. Of course, China is our biggest market for the S-Class, but we have a very loyal fan base in the United States and also in the European market. So uh, you have to look at uh, what do these customers expect. They want that little bit extra. They want us uh, to go beyond uh, what they can imagine and surprise them. Uh, so it's really for a clientele around the world. Do you think it could pull some wealthy buyers uh, back down to earth in terms of getting out of their SUVs? I mean, you've got the GLS, which is amazing. You've got the four liter, 48 volt system. Uh, you've got the G-Class, which is kind of a niche car, but I think you now have a two year waiting list for that. Um, can you get some of those buyers back down into sedans? Do you so want the, to? So the SUVs have been phenomenally uh, successful. I mean, the G is one of its kind. Uh, the GLS is really the S-Class of SUVs. Uh, for many customers, it's, it's, it's not an either or, it's an and. But uh, when it comes to this uh, luxury sedan and what the S-Class stands for and represents, especially that customer group with Mercedes is very, very loyal. So we have, uh, I think, a solid situation there, and I think uh, with the technology and the styling of this car, I think we can even grow that market. When are these cars going to go all electric? I mean, is the S-Class going to, will I be able to buy a 100% battery electric vehicle of the S-Class? Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility, so we have flicked the switch there, and really, uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. High tech together with 48 volt system mile hybrids. In the new S-Class we got a plug-in hybrid coming with up to 100 kilometers range WLTP. It's almost like you have a small electric car built in. Uh, and the S-Class will get a sibling that we call the EQS that we will launch next year on a dedicated electric architecture. So uh, for Mercedes-Benz you can really get all of the above will be, the e EQS will be an SUV. Can you challenge Tesla? Can you challenge uh, the Volkswagen Group in terms of electric vehicle sales numbers? Uh, the EQS is actually going to start as a sedan. Ah. But, uh, uh, thank you for the tip. Maybe we'll do a few SUVs off of that platform as well. Uh, at least it sounds very attractive as a, a segment is concerned. Uh, so, we are a uh, luxury brand. So naturally, when we look at the broad electrification, uh, we start with our top clientele, and this dedicated electric architecture will have a small family of vehicles around it, but we will also launch what we call compact uh, Mercedes vehicles, uh, electric ones also next year. So yes, we're going for a broad electric portfolio. What do you think about the, um, the gap in valuations between Daimler and Tesla. I mean, between Tesla and everything, it's been eye-popping, but, but why is there such a big gap and what can you do to make it up? Uh, we're investing in electrification, going CO2 neutral, uh, new software architectures based on artificial intelligence. We have fantastic styling and a luxury brand. If uh, that uh, market cap can serve as an inspiration to build on that, then uh, we should be quite optimistic about what's possible. The uh, S-Class is going to deliver profitability and I think the margins are something that you really want to beef up. How much can the S-Class contribute to your margin improvement and where do you want to be? The S-Class is important, whereas we don't disclose, of course, individual margins on vehicles. Uh, I don't think it's rocket science to figure out that the S-Class plays an important uh, part there. And also, it's this uh, pioneer uh, that breaks new ground for so many new technologies. And those technologies that we have now invested and paid for, they will very quickly trickle down into other vehicles that are just around the corner. So the rest of the portfolio benefits from the S-Class as well. 
but in terms of margins, I mean, you, you still need to cut costs. I think you want to cut about 500 billion euros, 450 in costs, is that right? We're doubling down on cost efficiency and are also doing some serious cost restructuring. In this transformation of the auto industry, we have to do both. We're investing at the highest levels ever, but we have probably our most stringent cost discipline and cost efficiency programs ever. And you got to deal with this balance, and I think that we can get leaner, slimmer, and at the same time unlock the capital that we need to put the innovations on the road uh, and be a winner of the transformation ultimately. You do want to reduce headcount as well as part of that restructuring, I think about 15,000 jobs. How are talks going with unions to do that? Uh, personnel cost is part of this. Of course, uh, we will do this in a socially responsible way. Uh, we have had extensive talks with the labor side and come to agreements, so uh, that have progressed quite well. Some of those decisions are, of course, tough, uh, but I think necessary in transformation to put us in a financial position of strength uh, to go through this transformation. As we get out of uh, this COVID crisis, do you see that supercharging some trends? I mean. Um, I certainly see electric car sales supporting the recovery in the market br broadly. We have already made the strategic decision to go towards CO2 neutrality, so you will see a whole host of electric vehicles from Mercedes coming here in the next few years, and perhaps COVID will also uh, add an additional push. Some of the legislation of the, of the COVID money that the governments are putting uh, uh, into their stimulus packages here in Europe also contain pieces to incentivize uh, uh, low carbon vehicles or electric vehicles. So yeah, it could be. But I think also that we see uh, what people has kind of taken for granted, your individual freedom, self-determined, individual mobility, the perfect way to do that is the car. So maybe we will also have a little bit of a renaissance of that thinking uh, as a result of COVID. What kind of uh, recovery are you seeing now? I mean, um, the Ministry of Economics here in Germany just said the recovery is going to be stronger, the, the downturn wasn't quite as bad as, as they had thought. Um, when are we going to see 2019 levels again at Daimler? It's hard to pinpoint exactly when we'll get back to that level, but what we can see now after we've had first the first quarter affected by the pandemic, first hitting China and then the second quarter, Europe and the United States, uh, we see now that sales are picking back up again. China is leading and uh, we're already now a couple or three months into quite healthy growth in China. Uh, United States and Europe are not on that level, but after that unprecedented drop that we had in Q2, we're now starting to come back uh, towards normal levels again. Um, speaking of China, you've got a battery deal there. You have some big shareholders um, out of China as well. Are you concerned about the rocky relationship um, between Washington and Beijing right now? We have very strong uh, partnerships in China. It's our biggest market on the passenger car side. Uh, for the U.S., it's our second biggest market on passenger, but our most important market on trucks. In the United States, we've been there over 100 years, more than 25,000 employees, 40 billion worth of sales, and I think it's 20-odd uh, factories that we have there. So for us, it's not an either-or. We got to be in both these important regions and uh, are building our investments in both. Are you confident that you have um, a solid battery supply and a stable you know, commodity pipeline in order to, to, to build the cars that you want to sell? Absolutely, and we have added a couple of very important strategic partnerships uh, only in the last uh, couple of months with CATL and also an up and coming player, Ferrisys, where we took an equity stake. Uh, not only to secure supply, that's important, but really to go into R&D together. A deep integration of R&D, looking at the innovations for the future. How can we push the game on, get better energy density? How can we get costs down uh, of the battery cells? So yes, I think we're in a strong position. In terms of the market, um, we've seen a lot of prices come down. And I know you aren't in a hurry to do any M&A, but when you look at some of the iconic brands that have been hit hard, especially in England or uh, India via England um, as well. Do you, are you tempted at all? We have no plans for M&A at this stage and we're very much focused on Mercedes-Benz. Uh, that's our core, uh, we know our customer, we're a technology, we're an innovation engineering driven company. We really want to be one of the architects of this transformation. So I don't think we need a distraction on some bigger M&A deal at this stage focus on our company, make it financially strong, and also lead in transformation. It's a good time to uh, be in the finance business. Rates are low. I mean, you know, financing the auto industry. You've been able to take advantage of that with uh, a big bond offering in the beginning of the year. Do you think you can go back for more? 
Our financing portfolio is substantial, both on the financing and leasing side around the world. And yes, uh, we had a very strong subscription uh, when we issued that bond. And the rates, in spite of COVID, had stayed quite reasonable. So the spreads have not gone crazy here. Uh, and I think that's important. I think it's also a good sign that financial markets, in this case, uh, kind of stayed rational. When do you think Daimler shares are going to be able to get back to a place that you're happy with them? I think there's a lot more potential. Uh, this company doesn't only have a great uh, history and tradition, it has an even greater future. And it's up to us to unlock that also in terms of share price. Uh, the current share price, in my point of view, should have a significant upside.